excited tonight uh, because I have a goal of getting from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11 in one, one evening. Uh, we'll see. The Lord is able. searched, I called, nobody could find them. I started feeling a little charismatic, like maybe it's a sign, right? <laughs> don't go back in there. He, he, don't want you to, he don't want you to go back to work. <laughs> Time to hang it up and find something else. To do. <laughs> and that, you know, I mean, I just had like a little bob in my step, a you know, jiggle in my head. I didn't quite raise my hand up, but it was getting, it was getting close. <laughs> And I had just counseled a colleague yesterday, you know, quote the scripture, you know, we encouragement, uh, as Paul says, servants work for your masters as unto the Lord. But man, when I thought there might be a sign, I was like, get your pen, this might be some new revelation coming. <laughs> but it, it was not. We found the keys and <laughs> reckon I'll be back there, back there tomorrow. <laughs> Lord willing. Uh, so uh, we've been in Genesis chapter 1, um, uh, and you know that that starts in the beginning, God. And he said, you know, why do we spend so much time, you know, sort of hanging out in Genesis? Well, we're laying these foundations just like God laid the foundations in the beginning. And we want to make this point that you want to have your theology before anthropology, right? In the beginning, God. He came first and then man. And this idea of theology first, anthropology second, uh, is important even in the day-to-day -day life, right? So this is where the Bible uh, from Genesis to Revelation becomes applicable to everyday life. When we're, we're trying to make a decision, we're trying to figure out what to do, we're thinking about, am I going to go back to work tomorrow? We want to have theology before anthropology. God's words, what does he say, what are his purposes, what's his will, as opposed to uh, the word, the idea, the thoughts of man. So that's, oh, that's what we're doing. We also want to have our protology before our eschatology. Okay, So eschatology is the study of, the thinking about, the writing about, last things. Okay? <coughs> uh, and, and eschatology is about where this is all going. So if you want some eschatological Literature, you think about Daniel chapter 9, 2 Peter, the book, the entire book of Revelation. Where is it all going? But before you get to the end, you've got to have the beginning, right? The first things. That's protology. <coughs> so that's what we're doing. That's our project here. So when God finished building his house, he called it good, okay? But he doesn't want the house to stay exactly as it is. He makes a good house, but he wants to make it better and better. Uh, he, even in the first chapters of Genesis, right? And God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. And then eventually God saw that it was very good, right? Better and better. So we're going to be thinking about how it's getting better and better. Uh, but, you know, before it gets better and better, this is the divine comedy, right? We've got, you know, good and then Things get spoiled, they go bad, uh, from good to worse, but then eventually better than ever. That's, that's the, the arc of comedy. Um, you know, this, this motif, this metaphor of a house, um, you know, we're, we're kind of using that as the structure of the, for our survey of the Old Testament. Um, and when we think about a house, um, I want you to think about what Jesus said about houses, right? Um, so if I, if I were to say, so finish this, if I were to say, in my father's house there are many mansions, many mansions all right, from John 14. Now, many mansions, how do you fit many mansions in a house? Aren't mansions houses, right? We think about mansions as being these big palatial things. What's Jesus talking about there, right? Um, and I'm talk we've been talking about in the Old Testament, Genesis, God is building a house. And then Jesus brings this up, my father's house. Well, where did his father's house come from? Well, that's what God's been doing since the beginning of right. Genesis. That's the house he's talking about, the place where God 
lives. Now that word mansion in our King James, it's, it's a dwelling place, all right? Or an abode. If you crack open a, a Strong's Concordance, you'll see that abode as in abide, right? And what else does Jesus say, all right? You abide in me and I abide in uh, you see, this, those mansions, those many mansions in my father's house, that's a metaphor for where the Holy Spirit lives, right? And after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, where does the Holy Spirit live? Amen. In us. Huh. Right? That's why we are living stones. Um, you know, in the revelation of, uh, of Jesus Christ, John sees uh, the new Jerusalem coming down. What's it look like? Well, it looks like a cube, right? Um, are we all going to live in a box? <laughs> We're going to live in a cube? Well, we could, we could if God wanted us to. But Revelation is about symbols, right? The first verses say, and he, he sent his messenger and he signified it, right? He rendered it into signs and symbols. So that cube is a symbol of perfection, right? Or a perfect block, right? Or another way you might say perfect block is chief cornerstone, right? That's what's coming out of heaven, right? Jesus Christ. And and where are we? Where do we live? Where are we in as Christians? We are in Christ, right? So all of the Old Testament, all of these symbols that God's laying down from Genesis forward, especially in the Torah, they're getting us ready for that, Amen. okay? Um, and, and that's one way to look at the New Testament. The entire New Testament is the eschaton uh, of the Old Testament, all right, of the Old Covenant, to where it's all been headed. Uh, Christ says he is the fulfillment of the law. Paul calls him the end of the law, not the, not the finish line, but where it's all been going, right? The, the ends justify the means, right? How you get there, where you're going, that's what he's talking about. Okay. So God's built this world, um, and, and he's, he's a creator, uh, and he wants uh, his glory reflected in his creation. So he makes this three-story house, he puts furniture in it, and then he puts a family in it, right? Because that family is going to reflect what? The triune God, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the relationship that's existed from eternity past, and it will continue to eternity future. He puts this family in his creation, and he gives them a job to do, right? Work, family, uh, government, right? All those things are pre-fall, okay? Um, be before Adam fell, uh, he had a job to do, he had a family to take care of, uh, there was a structure, a patriarchy, a hierarchy there, all right, and we have what's called the creation ordinances, okay? Um, so ordinances, think ordinance, order, command, okay? These are things God tells us to do. The first creation ordinance is trust God, Amen. right? Uh, and what, how are they supposed to do that? They had one job, all right? Don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? That's, that's just a, a badge of trusting in God. And if you trust God, you live forever in fellowship with him. And the pledge of that was the tree of life. Okay? Um, and it wasn't that God was always going to withhold, withhold that from them. They were eventually going to mature and get to eat. And because knowing the difference between good and evil is about judging, it's about ruling, it's about being a mature, competent king. Uh, and, and that was part of the dominion mandate. Uh, next creation ordinance is the sanctity of life, right? Uh, we can see that um, in uh, chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Whenever God takes the time to say something twice, back to back, pay attention. It's important, right? Mm -hmm. That's the foundation for everything we are, everything we do, uh, is that we are made in the image of God. So being made in the image of God, so murder was wrong before God ever told Noah that uh, you can't murder people because they're made in the image of God, right? When Cain killed Abel, 
that first murder. It was obviously wrong. They knew that. It was wrong. And that's what makes any murder wrong, right? Not because it makes people feel bad. Uh, not because you're depriving somebody else of life. What makes murder wrong is that, is that person is created in the image of God, right? Mm -hmm. You destroy God's image. That's why God instituted the death penalty after the flood, right? Um, and we could apply that to many things in our society, right? So, you know, people say, well, you know, it's because they're, they're creative and they have consciousness and yada, yada, yada. Well, that's true, but what it boils down to is that human beings are made in the image of God right. before they're born, after they're born, right. right? From the beginning of life, from conception to the, um, to the elder years, to maturity. So sanctity of life, that's a creation ordinance. The next creation ordinance is culture. All right, and that, that covers a lot of ground, right? He made them male and female. He put them together. That's marriage, right? So who ordains marriage? Who makes a marriage? God makes a marriage, right? And we, you know, in our culture and country, we want to say, um, well, you know, the, a man and a woman, uh, they enter into a contract and they get, no, God creates a marriage, Amen. right? Amen. Uh, they go in, Mr. Smith uh, and Miss Jones, and they come out, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. They're a new thing, a new creation. How do you get new creation? Human beings can't do that. Only God can do that, right? Mm -hmm. Only God makes new critters, right? So you have marriage as, a, as an ordinance, uh, procreation, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Uh, he tells the birds and the animals, uh, birds and the fish to be fruitful and multiply. And then uh, verse 28, uh, look at this. Verse 28 in Genesis 1, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Well, there's that motif again, right? Sky, land water right and it, it's it'll it'll repeat over and over again so what's the blessing right like you think it would be enough that god put created man put him in this beautiful garden um and he, he says and blessed them right um so what is that blessing well i think first it's god saying that it was very good and second the blessing is be fruitful and multiply right and you think about uh, throughout the Bible, where does that repeat itself? Where uh, a woman is barren, uh, she has no children, they, they want to be fruitful and multiply, but they can't, uh, and then God opens that womb and blesses them to be fruitful and multiply, right? So you could think about Sarah, you could think about Hannah, um, many, many examples. All right, so we have marriage, procreation, um, all right, so, so we know that story, but where's the relevance to that, all right, that be fruitful and multiply? As you read your, through your Bible, you're going to see that over and over again. And you don't have to turn with me, but I, I want to call out a couple of, couple of things to you. Colossians 1.10, it says, That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's be fruitful and multiply, right? Be fruitful in good works and multiply your knowledge of God. 2 Peter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to grab a few verses, 2, 8, and 17 to 19. Uh, 2 Peter 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So this is a practical application. This is still the same Genesis principle of be fruitful and multiply, having dominion over the earth. How do you do that? How do you do that in your day-to-day -day life? You get in the Word. You know Jesus Christ. You learn more and more about him. You grow in grace and knowledge. Uh, and then 17 to 19. 
For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Right? Heaven and a holy mountain. Heaven and earth. These themes are repeated. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Amen. This is Genesis 1, 3, right? Um, okay, be fruitful and multiply. Work and dominion, okay? Have dominion over the earth, subdue it. Uh, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And then uh, another creation ordinance is the Sabbath. So you work, you have dominion, you get to know God, you have a relationship with him and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the purpose of all that is driving toward Sabbath rest. Okay, um, and, and what is the end of the book of Revelation? That is a glorious picture of where this has all been headed. Sabbath rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's absolutely glorious. Okay. Now, these creation ordinances, they don't just apply to believers, okay? They also apply to non-believers. So they were first applicable uh, to Adam. He was responsible for them. Remember, we were all in Adam. In Adam all fell, all sinned. If, if Adam had this responsibility to God, every one of his descendants has the same responsibility. All right, the same responsibility to trust God, honor the sanctity of life, create culture. So get married, have kids, be fruitful and multiply, know God, have a relationship with him, work, have dominion over the earth, and honor that Sabbath rest. Okay? Um, and believers, right? Um, so New Testament believers, we still have the same obligation. We're still obliged to follow those creation ordinances. That's the general equity of the law, right? This part, this idea of what applies to believers and non-believers alike, right? Now, the problem is, is now, since the fall, we've got only a short time to get it all done in, right? We are, we are finite. Our days are numbered. Um, you know, you notice how uh, in the generations in Genesis, uh, the years they live get smaller and smaller, until now, we got, we're looking at three score and ten, maybe an extra ten by virtue of strength, and that's it, right? And guess, and guess where the, the um, life expectancy hovers? Around 78. Right. Yeah, that's, that's where it hovers. Um, okay, no, you know, despite the advances of modern medicine and everything else, uh, we're, we're still finite, limited creatures. All right, so God makes Adam and Eve in his image and likeness, wants them to be faithful copies. Adam is made from the dust. That's what Adam means. It means uh, a vessel uh, of the earth, a clay pot, or dirt bag. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what Adam means. Adam means dirt bag. And, and what, so, you know, um, there was one thing in God's creation that was not very good. What was that? That dirt bag was lonely, right? He was all by himself. And so God, uh, and man, the word for man in Hebrew is ish, it means fire, okay? So when Ezekiel is confronting the prophets of Baal, he calls on God to send down some ish, some fire. And yet here in Genesis, that's the same word for man, all right? So somehow uh, you've got fire and, and dirt mixed together. Well, isn't that, isn't that what we see? Uh, in, in chapter 2 that uh, verse 7 and the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became the living soul he set that dirt on fire with his breath his spirit so it's no surprise that when we get to Acts chapter 2 when God wants to set his people on fire what does he do he lights them on fire Right? There's flames above their head. The wow, why? Because the spirit had come. They're on fire now. Right? So you hear the phrase on fire for Jesus, and I don't think people realize where that's coming from. Right? It actually comes from Genesis. 
Um, so anytime you see uh, winds blowing, that's the Holy Spirit, and don't be surprised if fire happens right after it. And that's exactly what happened. That happened in the book of Acts. You get a wind, and they get set on fire. Uh, the wind uh, blows through the Red Sea, opens it, and you get a cloud, this glory cloud of fire shows up, right? Again and again and again. Spirit, uh, wind, fire. Okay, so... Um, so you've got you've got dirt bags set on fire. Uh, he is blessed um, by woman um, in this in this death and resurrection uh, story. Um, unless he was cutting the grass, and brother brother Keith didn't hear. So if, if Adam was had to cut the grass, that was the first death first death and resurrection story. Um, I'm going to go with uh, when Ad, uh, God puts Adam to sleep. Um, that that's the first death and resurrection story. How asleep do you need to be to have a rib carved out of you? You got to be about dead, right? <laughs> so God, um, God essentially puts Adam to death, and when he wakes up, when he's resurrected, uh, there's a new creature. Right? There's a new creature woman, but they're married. So you've got this new thing. Um, and she's called Isha, flame girl, fire girl. Okay? Um, and and this, this won't make it on a, on a Hallmark card. Um, but what does, uh, what, does, what does Adam say when he wakes up? Verse 22-23. And Adam said, right? This is now, now the KJV is not doing us any favor, but this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Isha, fire girl, because she was taken out of man. And later she's going to be Eve, which is hot mom. <laughs> the mother of all living. Uh, so, so you've got, and, and Eva comes, so you've got Flambo and hot mom. And that's what God made. Now, now, like I said, this won't make it on a Hallmark card, but read, read what that says. Verse 23, Adam said, this is now, right? Um, what that's saying is, finally, at last, right? Adam is actually praising God for his wife, for woman. All right, then he institutes the first marriage, starting in verse 24, right? And all marriages will be reflections of, of that first one. All right, so we're just being faithful copies. So God is king over all creation. Adam is going to be king over what? Over the critters, right? He's going to name them. Uh, he's going to be over, and in each of the, the compartments, land, sea, and air, they've got their own rulers. Uh, but man is over them, and God is over man. Okay. And Queen Eve is going to be by his side. God works, so man works. God's a builder, so Adam's got to be a builder. God gives him tools, right? Tools are a form of wealth, so God gives him lots of wealth to do this with. Uh, wealth like family, kingdom, tools, okay? Um, all right. Now, so uh, this is a quote uh, from Jim Jordan. When God made the world, he commissioned humanity to keep working on it, transforming nature into culture, bringing the world from glory to glory. Man's task was and is to actualize all the potential of the world. In Jesus Christ, humanity is put back on track, the track of making a God-glorifying world. Right? That idea of from glory to glory uh, is extremely important. All right? uh, that's represented in marriage. Right? Um, so man is the glory of creation, is the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Okay, uh, uh, Proverbs um, 12, 4, uh, a virtuous woman is a crown. What is a crown? It's a symbol of glory, all right, of the glory of the king. So what is, and, and you know, people read 1 Corinthians 11 or Ephesians 5, and they're like, oh, Paul was just trying to, you know, put women in their place. You think about what he's saying. If man is the glory and woman is the glory of man, that means women are the glory of the glory. Um, another way to say that is 
holy of the holies, right? Um, that's that's God's creation. That's there is no there is no culture, there is no religion in the history of man that thinks anything like that. That's right. right? And who who laid that out and pointed that out, connected the Old Testament and New Testament? That was Paul, right? Uh, Paul was not the president of the E Man Woman Hater Club. <laughs> so I like to think. All right, what about more glory? We're supposed to take this stuff uh, in the earth that God's created and do something with it to make it more glory. What's another example? Well, this. This is a cube of glass and dirt, and it does many, many things. Right? It, is, it is an incredible gift of God, and like all gifts of God, it can be used for evil. Right? That's, that's what man is really good at. We, right. we have this, these gifts of God. We, we create uh, in the image of, of God our Father, uh, and, and he leads us to make some incredible things out of the earth, and then we take his good gifts and we do bad things with it. Right? Amen. Amen. Um, so, you know, other tools, right? Hammers, wheels, jet planes, washing machines, air conditioning. These are all good gifts of God, and they're all uh, an example of man subduing the earth, right? Uh, uh, like David subdued his enemies, uh, it means to victory in war, right? Um, uh, subduing something to a good purpose, right? And, and when you work and you accomplish that, what do you do? You celebrate. That's what Sabbath feasting is, right? That's what the Lord's Supper is, right? It's celebrating a work accomplished, right? And celebrating is a form of warfare, okay? Uh, the Lord's Supper, when Christians get together and we celebrate, that is a declaration of war on all the principalities and powers because what are we celebrating? Look at what God has Amen. done, right? We're giving him the glory that is his due. Um, yeah, we're not making up the Genesis 2 and 8. Right? <laughs> um, all right. So, Adam's in this world that's very good. There's no wicked enemy to resist him, but he's still got hard work to do in the earth, right? Herding cats was hard work, both before and after the fall. <laughs> Nothing changed there. Um, okay. So, um, in, in working and serving, he's worshiping God, he's serving God. Uh, Adam is to be uh, faithful, he's, to, he's supposed to raise up faithful, godly children. Uh, Adam's the king of the world, but he's always going to be a servant to the high king. Right? Uh, and if Adam subdues the world like God told him to do, he'll be building a house for God within the house that God has built for him. That's a motif that we're going to see again, right? So Adam put Adam is put in a garden. It's faced toward it's in toward the east in Eden. Uh, that means there's other lands outside the garden. Uh, there's a river flowing out, right? It's a well watered garden. Uh, those four rivers flow out. They water the rest of the world. So you have the tree of life, a river. The river goes out to the world. We see that again in the book of Revelation. The tree of life and a river going out to the world, right? What was happening in the garden was supposed to expand to the entire creation. Um, just, just this idea of, of the garden being in the east. Um, when, when they get kicked out, right, um, the garden is in the east. That means its gate, its entrance is in the east. Um, so if you're outside the garden, you can't go east to get back in. You hit the wall, okay? So to get back to the gate, you've got to travel west and come back around and come in to the gate, right? Think about having to go the entire circumference of the globe to get back to that door. Um, so you want to be going west. You don't want to be going east and hitting the brick wall. Well, when Cain is cast out of the land and wanders in Nob, that's east of Eden. Lot moves east and settles near Sodom. Nothing good happens. Israel enters the land from Egypt. They circle around to Moab, cross the Jordan from the east, right? That shows that they're entering that land, flowing with milk and honey. It's like returning to the garden. When uh, Israel goes into exile, they don't go west. They're taken east, away from the land. 
And in the New Testament, the wise men come from the east, traveling to the west, seeking the new creation, right? the baby Jesus, the real tree of life. Um, that garden is on a mountain, and there are rivers running down it uh, to the rest of the world. Ezekiel chapter 28 recalls this. This is a type of God's holy mountain. We see a lot about that, right? The mountain of Zion, God's holy mountain. That's going to be repeated throughout the Bible. What's that about? It's the place where God meets with man. Okay? Um, and we're going to see how man tries to uh, counterfeit that in, in Genesis 11. All right? uh, so we have God's holy mountain. God meets with people on mountains and hills um, um, throughout the Bible. Okay? Uh, so, and that's that's just symbolizes a return to the garden, the place where God meets with man. Samuel conducts worship in Ramah, which means high place. David brings the ark to Jerusalem, sets it in a tent on Mount Zion, and later God instructs Solomon to build his temple on the mountain in Jerusalem. All right. So God puts Adam in the garden. He's supposed to subdue it and rule it. That means guard it, work it, serve and build. All right. Worship and reign. These are both um, priestly duties, right? Uh, protector type duties. Um, all right. So in the garden, you see water and trees, man and woman on the mountaintop. Uh, there's some other repetitions of that. Uh, men uh, like Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses, um, we keep going. They get their wives at, by wells. They're a garden in the desert. Uh, then you, fat, um, Jacob flees Esau. He meets, meets Rachel at the well of Haran. Moses fights off shepherds, attacking Jethro's daughters. So these are garden scenes. They're supposed to remind us of new Adams and new Eves until finally there's a new Jacob and a new Moses. He's the last Adam. And you find him in John chapter 4 talking about mountains and the water of life. At a well. All right. And what's, what's Jesus <coughs> doing there with the Samaritan woman at the well? Well, the, all those other patriarchs, they went and got their brides at a well. And what, what's the first place where, where Jesus proclaims himself to be the Messiah? It's to a woman at a well. Amen. Right. This is, this is the, the, the nidus, right, uh, of the church, the bride of Christ. That's, that's, what, that's what we're supposed to be remembering. When we read that scene in, in John chapter 4, we're supposed to be remembering the Torah, remembering Genesis, and all these uh, patriarchs getting their wives at well. And so, you know, it's no wonder that the patriarchs, they run around digging wells all throughout Genesis, right? And their enemies come and clog them up, and then there's issues there. Isaac runs around digging wells, and when he finishes the third well, there is peace. And what does Isaac say? Now we can be fruitful in the land. He's like a new Adam looking for a well-watered place in the land to be fruitful and multiply. All right? Be fruitful and multiply. How do we fall? By fruit. Right? Adam fails as king and priest because he didn't guard, he didn't keep, he didn't protect, he didn't serve obediently, uh, and he engaged in false worship by not trusting God. Right? So he sins. You have a king and a priest who sins. <coughs> We're going to see that repeated later in the Old Testament. He sins by taking and eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And wrapped up in that is looking and coveting, uh, robbing God of his glory. Um, you know, what did Satan tempt Eve with? You will be as God's little g, right? Uh, and he, that you'll know good and evil, right? He didn't lie. Not about that. Because when they ate, they knew that God was good and they were evil. Right? And they were ashamed. They knew the difference. Um, so they're driven out, right? And to keep them away from the uh, from living forever and just making things all the worse, right? Could you imagine if these, uh, 
you know, they're not mature in the Lord. Um, they've been unfaithful if they were allowed to live forever. Now, they lived a good long time, but had they been allowed to live forever, uh, it, it would not have been good, right, for creation. They would continue to rebel <coughs> against the creative order, uh, and we see that that's, that's what they did, but that was cut short. Um, they're driven out. Uh, multiple of these heavenly creatures, these cherubs, so cherubim, that's plural, they've got spinning lightsabers, it's supposed to keep everybody out of the gate, right? <coughs> you've got, you've got uh, Fire Boy and Flame Girl, they're kicked out, they lose that glory, right? Now, fire is a bad thing. Fire will burn them. Fire is dangerous, right? Before, they were all lit up with fire, right? They were fire. They, they were reflecting the glory of God. And now, it will hurt them. They can't approach God. It becomes dangerous to them, okay? Um, and so now no human can get back to the garden and meet with God, meet the tree of life. And so there in Genesis 3.15, none of this catches God by surprise, right? Before the foundations of the earth, the world were laid. Um, who was laying them? Right? The one who was creating them, the one who was holding them all together, the one who still keeps everything ordered so we can have physics and, and, and regular laws and discover what the universe is doing and what it's about, the one that holds everything together, uh, gives us the very breath that we're breathing right now. Um, he's the one that's going to set it all to rights. Right? So this was all foreknown. Um, but in Genesis 13, we have the first promise of a Savior. And he'll be a great warrior. And he'll win the victory over Satan. But not right away. The entire Old Testament is about what God does to prepare for the coming of the seed of the woman from Genesis 3.15. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't learn our lesson. Um, remember I showed you that, that diagram, <coughs> garden, land, world. We just kept on falling, right? Um, we have sort of representatives that are going to be, you know, you keep getting these uh, second Adam, second Adam, new Adam, new Adam, so on and so forth. They keep repeating until we get to the last Adam, right? That's why Christ is the last Adam. But these patterns keep being repeated. So in the garden was the place. Adam was the center. Eating, uh, disobeying God was the sin. Uh, and the judgment was being cast out of the garden. So now they're out in the land. Cain sins by killing his brother. He's cast out of the land. Right? Then you have the, the world. Um, you, in in uh, Genesis 6, the sons of God marry the daughters of men, that's a sin. They are cast out of the world via the world. Right? Um, and believe it or not, that will almost bring us to Genesis 10 for next time. So, <laughs> uh, any questions or thoughts?